welcome. Welcome to Realize 2020. Um, me live from a studio somewhere in the world and you're probably listening at home in your study, in your living room, in your bedroom, uh, maybe even in the office. Um, but we live in different times and we would of course have loved to um, welcome you to a physical event, but we do it quite differently now. And this is the way via this platform. Um, we have a full agenda today. We will start with the presentation of IT operations management with um, Lars and with uh, Ketil um, uh, from Sikahus Partner, who will uh, introduce in, the, in a while. Uh, in the meantime, I want to tell you that uh, during this session, you can chat with us. My colleagues are live and, um, and any questions we try to answer is as quickly as possible. And I would like to introduce Lars, Lars Rossen. Hi Lars, welcome. Hey. Hey, Renko, how are you doing? I'm doing fine here. You got a beautiful Realize 2020 background. You, uh, we have a That's full great. agenda um, and you're going to speak and that makes me very happy. First of all, you're going to tell about um, what we all can do, but then you speak with a very important customer of us, Sikahus Partner. Um, um, we can do this very shortly. I will say good luck. Uh, I would look forward to your presentation and uh, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Remco. And uh, so the, the uh, first presentation here is around AI ops in a cloudy world. And that's a, kind of a strange title I'm putting on it. Um, one thing I want to portray in this uh, presentation is what is real and what is hype? Because there is for sure quite a lot of hype associated with AI ops these days. Uh, I hope you're all uh, sound and safe in where you are in, in the world, as, as Remco was uh, telling us, is that we are all at home, etc. We are not physically meeting, so Q&A is slightly more complicated, but there is uh, plenty of opportunities for you to ask questions online, and we will come back with answers to all your questions um, during the day, during the week. Uh, we'll follow up afterwards as well. Uh, but anyway, let's dive into AI ops in a, in a cloudy world. Now, what does AI ops really mean, right? Uh, it should be obvious. Uh, a lot of people are, are but nevertheless using it slightly haphazardly in terms of what they really mean. And, and I have came up with a number of alternatives to what it could mean, uh, like alternative information operation or a, a variant of that would be advanced information of education or additional information operations or algorithmic intelligence operation or artificial intelligence operations. Or what about all inclusive operations? Now, um, I guess if, if this was a pop quiz, most of you would go with the uh, artificial intelligence operations, but actually um, algorithmic operations is something that uh, some people seriously talk about. This is really what it's about. Um, personally, I, I like the all-inclusive, uh, so I'll come to that. Um, and, and in reality, some of the approaches for implementing this is actually more on the first ones. Uh, alternative information operation, I'll explain what I mean by that. Now, you could come up with a lot of other acronyms or, or explanation of the acronyms, but, but all of these are somewhat relevant to what people are really doing. But if we stick with the concept of, of artificial intelligence operations for a second, then I think there's a very important thing to remember, and that is humans are still smarter, right? And so the reason why I'm saying that is that there is a belief by some people in the industry that because of AI and this enormous progress that AI has been making over the last few years, um, algorithms can just take over and they can do it all. But the reality is, and, and it's, it's actually a hard reality that has faced us a number of times uh, during the evolution of AI, is that um, if we ourselves don't really understand what is going on, then very likely the algorithms are not correct either. And, and so it needs to learn from somewhere. So we need to understand it before we can get the algorithms to work. You also say that um, there is, uh, with any hype, uh, a follow on value of dissolution where it's realized that AI might not be as good as it was supposed to be. Um, and that's what we are trying to short circuit and say, let's, let's move beyond the hype initially and then fix it uh, in uh, 
consistently uh, with the hard work that is associated from day one, instead of believing that, that you can do it uh, the other way around by just applying an algorithm and then it just works, right? Uh, as you all know, probably is that AI is actually a pretty old concept. Um, the last time that it became uh, popular, if you will, was around 60s, uh, where uh, everybody believed that the computers and the algorithms would take over. And then in the 70s, it didn't really work. And then in the 80s, it popped up again, and it was expert systems. And then in the 90s, that died out again. And now here in the uh, in the last five years, it has got a big, big swing back, especially because of the machine learning, self-learned algorithms and the uh, added compute power we have. But again, we have to be very careful about that. Uh, well, maybe the world is more complicated than we believe, and we are already seeing signs of the fact that this is not really working. So, okay, with that said, let's dive in a little bit more. Let's start with uh, the advanced information uh, operations or obfuscation and say, what, what is really going on when, when, when this is what is happening in an organization? Well, your starting point is that you have uh, a lot of different monitoring tools. You have many, many people running around trying to solve problems. It typically works in silos. Your entire uh, operations organization is very reactive. Um, and your consumers of operations, the people that consumes all the, the digital products, the digital services that you as an IT organization are delivering, are pretty dissatisfied with what is going on. So um, you, uh, you contacted various vendors and they say, well, okay, it's very simple. Well, you, you, uh, you create this enormous data lake, you collect everything you can, and then we, uh, we have this really, really uh, smart machine learning algorithm. It will baseline it, um, and, and, and then you can find stuff, right? Um, turns out that the, it's not really good enough out of the box. So you also um, buy some expensive data scientists, and they go around, and it becomes a research project, really. Now, the issue with this approach is that the result is really just more confusion. You will have the ML uh, machine learning algorithms finding out that there's something going on, something that is not right. You will find some unknown unknowns, um, which is fine, but it doesn't really help your day-to-day -day operations. You're actually just getting more information. You're getting more confused. Uh, your, your, uh, your wheel that you run around, you run faster and faster, but you still don't really satisfy the dissatisfied uh, users. Uh, so that's really the tagline here is that if you just think that you can apply some machine learning algorithms, some smart AI, and you solve your problem, then, well, if you haven't figured it out yourself, then probably the AI can't do it either for you. So that's not the way to go. So let's go to another approach. Um, additional information operation. Well, that's really to go and say, well, you already have an operation. It is doing something. It's not worthless, right? Uh, let's do some incremental uh, improvement to become a more comprehensive operations team, right? So you have the same starting point, right? But what you do is that you systematically add data feeds for your operational white space. I will come back to the white space in, in, in a few slides, but, but one of the things with, with uh, many organizations operating in silos is that there is white space uh, between the silos, and you don't monitor that. Because you don't monitor, it's difficult to really figure out what is going on. To find out what is white space, part of it is also to consolidate the systems. Maybe not by rip and replace all the system with a single uh, consolidated system, but making sure all the subsystems, all the various monitoring systems get consolidated into a manager of manager, an operations bridge. Um, and then you start adding topology information. And we'll talk a lot about that uh, during the day because really understanding all the data feeds you have, what's the purpose of these individual uh, configuration items that you are monitoring, right? What do they provide in terms of service in the grander scheme of things? And you might not be able to add all of the topology, but you can add some of it. And then suddenly what happens is that you're starting to actually have all the incidents to be visible. Um, they are available, the information, so you can do deduction and correlation. It might still be manual. Uh, you're still reactive. You're still overloaded. 
but you start at least to have a clue on what goes on. <clears throat> so that's kind of one thing that, that AI could mean is that you add additional information to your operations to be comprehensive in what you manage. If you've done that, then you can start applying algorithms. Algorithms works on data, and if you don't have the data, that is the previous foil, then you have an issue, right? So your starting point is that consolidated monitoring. You have the comprehensive set of data. You have well-defined configurations information. Now you can start doing interesting things algorithmically. You can do event day duplication. You can do topology correlation. You can do root cause analysis. You can do uh, remediation automation, right? And the improvement is vast, right? You're certainly doing much more with less people or doing all the things you should be doing with the people you are. You have the meantime to repair MTTR to decrease dramatically because you immediately know when something goes wrong that you can start uh, fixing it, right? So, so this algorithmic information operation, that's what a lot of organizations could benefit from getting to, right? It's not really called AI yet, uh, but it's pretty important to do. It's something that we in Microfocus has been preaching for quite a number of years. Uh, we have solutions for this, but we still see maturity curve-wise that a lot of organizations are still not really at this level. And if you don't do this level, it's difficult to move on to the next one. The next one, that's artificial intelligence operation. That is kind of the full stack AI ops, if you will. Uh, you observe, you engage, you act, uh, you do big data analytics, you do machine learning, right? So you have the starting point from the previous uh, slide. You already have uh, automation scripts available. You, you have well-defined configurations. Uh, you have consolidated stuff. Um, now you can start applying uh, machine learning algorithms, which will do some additional work. It would do unknown unknowns, <clears throat> right? Stuff you couldn't correlate by a simple algorithm because you don't know what should be correlated, but it figures out something weird is going on. Now, if that was the only thing you applied, that was back to the, the first uh, aspect is that then everything is an unknown unknown and you drown in it. You still need to have your starting point in place that all the regular thing that goes wrong is being managed. You can also start understanding trends. You can do predictions so that you can um, you can really optimize uh, how you operate and you can uh, be uh, uh, faster in uh, resolving issues because you're actually dealing with it before it truly becomes a service affecting issue, right? You can also use the AI algorithms to find and propose remediations, right? So it's not only about finding what is wrong, but also uh, finding out what is the typical response you would use in a in a given situation. You can have a learning algorithm that would say, well, normally operators will use this script in this situation, so why don't we do that again? And eventually you say, oh, it's just going to go ahead and do it uh, for you because you're always choosing that remediation action, right? Um, you could have chat box that use natural language processing, also an AI uh, discipline, if you will, that allows you to actually converse and talk with the systems themselves, right? And the result, improvements again, right? You have fewer service impacting situations because you have been predictive in what you do. And now you're starting to get more time to actually optimize how you operate, right? You get into this positive cycle that, that will help you um, run your operations. So this is the end of it, right? You got AI ops, we're all done, we're good. If you implement this, we can all be happy. Well, um, I would say that for many organizations, if you get to this level, it's a really good thumbs up. Yes, uh, you've done well, but you can do more, right? And that is what I term the all-inclusive operations. It's, uh, it's really breaking down the walls uh, between operations and the rest of the organizations, right? Um, and that is, and when we talk about predictive operations in, in this sense, that is what we, we had in the previous uh, slide. Uh, now you can start to optimize the end-to-end -end value streams or end-to-end -end use cases uh, across the plan, build, deliver, and run of the organization. Your operations team becomes uh, 
a team player in the bigger scheme of things. Some people call this DevOps, but it's actually more than DevOps. Um, and again, and a little bit further in this presentation, I'll come into the details of what I mean with that. Uh, you also start creating the larger integrated automated big clip, as some people call it, and, and clip it stands for closed loop incident process. It's not enough to have a team that manages incident, it needs to link with the rest of the organization. The result, if you get to this point, is that you would see that the number of incidents, even predictive incidents, drops dramatically because you fix stuff at the root cause and you prioritize what matters. And suddenly operations become an active player in delivering innovation to the organization. Think about that. Um, if you're used to being an operations team, you're always at the receiving end of troubles, right? Uh, something is being thrown over the wall to you, you just need to deal with it. If you do it well, nobody thanks you because of course you, it should be running. The reason why it's doing well is not because you did a good job, it was because whoever threw it over the wall threw something good over the wall, right? Uh, but if it's not going well, then everybody's pointing at you. Why don't you reset the server? Why don't you scale out the solution? Why didn't you predict this was gonna get wrong? Why did you accept the patch because it's not working, et cetera, et cetera. This is the way that you can solve that. So, all-inclusive operations is not easy, right? And again, if you start by doing that as the first task, then you will have some issues. Later in this presentation, I'll talk to Sucus Partner, one of our customers from Microfocus, that is actually doing part of this all-inclusive operations. It's not like the last thing, they are also working on the other activities that I described and, and you will get some insight into how to actually do this. But I will, I will talk more about it in this uh, presentation. I'll enlighten you a bit about how to actually do it. But there is an aspect of you need to choose your path. Do you know that there is no silver bullet in, in this world? The people that go to you and say, okay, I have this fantastic AI product, it'll just solve your problem, just put it in and you're done. They, um, they are essentially lying to you. So you are hopefully not in the lower left-hand uh, corner of this figure, which is uh, you're completely clueless and every, every event that you collect is, is very siloed. Um, but very few people are in the upper right-hand corner, very few, right? And so finding that path in, in, in getting consolidated data, get connected data, unifying the data lakes, uh, and at one axis and the other one being moving from reactive to consolidated to automated to preventive is where you want to go to. And the, what I indicated in the previous slides are things that you need to do in order to get to that level. But if you try to short circuit it, you might get to a point where you have more data, but you're still clueless. You're still really not solving your problem. So be careful out there. So you might ask the question, so what should I do? And, uh, and so I'm breaking it down into five, uh, I wouldn't call them simple steps because they're, they are still pretty large and complex, but I'm breaking down into six steps that you need in order to develop uh, AI ops. It's not like you can't do one of the steps without having done the previous steps uh, before, but there is a certain degree of maturity order in those five steps. The prerequisite for the five steps, step zero, if you will, is to actually understand your landscape. And, and this is where we see that there is significant challenges in this world because the landscape just keeps getting more and more complex. Every decade, your landscape is likely worse than it was in the previous decade. It was very easy back in the 70s where you fundamentally just had a mainframe and everything ran on that mainframe. Um, you might not have a mainframe any longer. You might have been able to get rid of that one uh, for whatever reason. Uh, there are some good things to be said about mainframes. <laughs> they, can, they can deliver really good value, right? But you get all of these various kinds of platforms and infrastructure providers, and a lot of organizations have a, a path towards saying, we need to uh, have a much cleaner and well-understood operations, uh, and we're gonna do that by building a new house where we standardize all of these kinds of things and we move everything over to a standardized platform. And I'm tempted to say, good luck with that. 
if your organization just have a little bit of complexity, then it takes a long time to replatform everything. Um, and when you finally done that, there will be yet another platform that is actually much better. And there will be a product that is uh, associated. And some of it you're not even in control of, right? Uh, like all the things in the upper left-hand corner here, which are all the SaaS providers that you're starting to use. Let's take an example, uh, Oracle, for instance, right? You might have been running Oracle in your private data center. Uh, Oracle have a, a great offer uh, with database as a service, and you can move it to there. And that database as a service, in many ways, is a smarter database than the ones that you can run on-premise. It has a built-in AI algorithms that will optimize the database, that will improve the database uh, automatically behind the scenes so that it just works, except when it doesn't, right? Uh, and, and that goes back to saying, well, uh, AI can only do so much, right? There will be other kinds of issues, potentially. Maybe it's a connectivity issue. Maybe it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue that, because of its optimization, it's suddenly much more expensive to, to run it. There can be many things that goes on there. Uh, so it just makes it more complex. There are new disciplines to be, to be had in order to do it. Another example is Kubernetes. Um, uh, and again, right now, this is the, uh, the hot kit on the block in terms of, of infrastructure and platform as a service. Uh, so you dockerize, you put everything in container of, of the new things you want to run, and you run these containers uh, collectively as pods in, uh, in Kubernetes clusters. Okay, fine and great. And if we look at how Kubernetes works these days, uh, it has a degree of maybe not AI, but at least algorithms built in that would automatically re-deploy uh, pods or containers if a node goes down, it will scale out nodes in, in order to meet performance requirements. It has a lot of logic that normally operations will take care of, and that's now embedded into the platform. So the, in principle, the idea, and that was uh, the, the, the core idea when, when Google uh, invented Kubernetes originally, is that let's make sure that the data, uh, the search algorithms, and all the other things that run on top of, of these uh, clusters just automatically scales out and up and 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 repair themselves, and it's fully automatic, right? <clears throat> if you've been involved in any deployment of Kubernetes, you will realize that while it's pretty uh, uh, difficult, you uh, create errors in how they're configured, uh, you do patches of Kubernetes, they are not compatible, there are all the things that can go wrong with this. And even though the technology is improving and it's getting better and better every day, it is not easy to manage Kubernetes. It might even be more difficult to manage Kubernetes because there is a lot of algorithms built in. There is a lot of intelligence built into those subsystems. So AI ops, and that's some of the hype preachers on it is to say, well, let's, let's move all the operations into the products themselves so they are automatic. Um, but that still, in the big scheme of things, just makes it more complicated again. So the understand your landscape as a step uh, zero is that you need to have a good understanding of how complex is it the thing you're actually managing. And once you start mapping this out and looking a little bit into the future of where you want to go, I'm pretty sure you get a picture like this, actually with much more details. It is going to be pretty complex, but understanding the complexity is pretty important. And with that in mind, you can start to automate the hybrid IT monitoring. Really getting to the point of saying, okay, in this entire landscape, let me make sure that I collect data from all the various aspects of the landscape. And you then store that in that data lake that is a foundation for a lot of algorithms in the future, right? And so that's part of the microfocus um, vision and we now have implemented uh, the vision really is this collect one, store one, COSO uh, solution. Um, we're not starting from scratch. We have a lot of legacy uh, code and algorithms and understanding that we reuse in that setting to collect all of these various uh, aspects from your landscape. We are using a 
storage technology called Vertica, which is an analytic database that's also one of our core assets in, in MicroFocus, the leading uh, data lake platform, if you will, that we embed in this solution. And then the first step you can do on top of that, so I'll call it step two here, is you can start to create business value and performance dashboards. And now you would say, well, that's nothing to do with AI ops, right? It's nothing to do with artificial intelligence. No, that's right. But in terms of creating value, it is really great if you are very early on in your process, can start creating some value for the non-IT people, the executives, so that you can connect your operations with your business, right? Because at the end of the day, business pays for for uh, for the all, for everything. They pay for operations. They need to be happy. And if you very early on can give you uh, these non-IT people insight into what is going on, and you can say at the, at the right-hand side, you, um, well, no, sorry, at the left-hand side, you would you would create various kinds of dashboards that just helps operations themselves to get an end-to-end -end view of what is going on, uh, real-time, uh, overtime performance analysis dashboards, for instance, which is something we can deliver out of the box, or general dashboards on on what is the experience of all the digital services that are being delivered. But then you can start customizing these dashboards into business-oriented dashboards. There is one illustrated here with Southwest. <clears throat> but I'd like to um, exemplify an, in, in a Nordic setting. Uh, there was an airport um, in the Nordic that where the, um, where the baggage uh, claims and baggage distribution, baggage handling system, which is fundamentally just operational technologies um, so there's a lot of IT involved in these package handling systems for them to be fully automatic. And that was monitored by Operations Bridge, um, our monitoring solution. And what we built together with the chief operating officer slash chief technology officer, so really outside of IT, we built a dashboard that constantly gave KPIs and performance metrics for the package uh, uh, distribution. And in principle, it wasn't really an IT operations issue. It was a company operating issue that was dashboards out there. But all the metrics came into IT because that's where you consolidated it. And so that dashboard allowed the senior management to know in real time exactly when the uh, baggage claim had issues. And if any of you have remember when we traveled around, I know it's a long time ago since we last were in an airport, many of us, but nevertheless, if there is issue with baggage claims, everything becomes problematic in the airport. There's so many things, processes that depend on that just to work. So they can now react very quickly. It's actually not the operations people that need to do something, but they've created value from the executives by doing this. And there's so many places where you can create that value out of that data lake that you've collected that is really valuable outside of operation itself. You can also, the way we've constructed the solution is you can bring your own business intelligence reporting tools. You can do all other kinds of, of things. You don't depend on us having developed a dashboard or our dashboard technology being right for you. You can create these other dashboards. And then suddenly, if you start doing that, then you become a business partner. You become part of the innovation loop uh, for the organization. And once that is happening, you get a lot more brownie points for uh, investing more in your solution for doing more with your solution, right? So even though it's not applying AI algorithms itself, it's using the foundation to create value very quickly. And so we recommend that you do that very early on in your adaptation of these technologies that are associated with AI ops. Step three is to start getting more out of multi-mode correlation, uh, which is complicated and can be showed in many different ways. I actually uh, have another one here that is maybe a better way of illustrating it. Um, you fundamentally are starting to consolidate all the various events that comes from all the application and networks and third-party integrations you have. And again, we are proud to be part of what we term a um, open composable architecture. So we don't insist that 
everything needs to happen within our platform. We can integrate with, with everything. But then you get all of these events from the various subsystems in, and then we have different sets of correlation that we can allow, uh, apply. There's basic event uh, reduction, deduplication of events. Um, we can do it with our agents-based technologies close to where the events are creating, so we don't create noise in the system. We can detect event storms that, that, that happens and, and co correlate those events together early on. So again, that the system isn't drowning in information. You only get the, the, the interesting information. You can, um, you can synchronize the way you collect your events with uh, the things that happens in the ITSM world, and we'll come back to that as well, uh, where you, uh, you know that you will take certain systems down for maintenance, for upgrades, and that typically leads to a lot of events being generated around it because, oh, uh, the, the system is not alive any longer, right? But it's not an issue for operations. It's well planned. You can, uh, you can correlate those uh, activities with the events and, and, uh, and get the noise out of the system. And then you can create more advanced optimized correlations. Uh, and, and we have three... Uh, major technologies that are available out of the box directly to use, um, stream-based event correlation, topology-based event correlation, and time-based event correlation, right? And so uh, topology-based event correlation, that's, that's almost a, a, a given, but there is surprisingly many organizations that, that don't understand it. So if you have a performance event um, on, on, a, uh, on, a, on a CPU and you know you have issues with the disk, then they are probably correlated. If you then have slow response times on a service that runs on top of those systems, then those are correlated. You can, you can easily figure that out if you have the topology and you have the algorithms available. Time-based event uh, automation is something around saying, okay, if, if, a, if a system uh, up comes closely after a system down event, then you correlate them together. Uh, they're in, in the same time frame, and, and, and you know they, uh, uh, they, they uh, map each other out. It was just a fluke. Um, or you can say if a given um, critical event has not been dealt with within a, a short time frame, then you can escalate it uh, to a higher severity or to uh, an incident. Uh, so you use the, the, the time aspect to, to do the, uh, the correlation. And then finally, at the bottom of this slide, you can, uh, you can start having these uh, machine learned algorithms that can, that can do further advanced event correlation based on, on baselining and other uh, smart algorithms. And when you have these correlated things, then you can, should be able to automatically move it into to process automations of, of various sorts. And we're showing two here. Um, next slide, I'll explain uh, the, the operations orchestration aspect. That is the, the primary one we use in MicroFocus. And our experience is that by doing these things, actually, even before you get to the very bottom of it, you can easily get a, at least a 90% event reduction. We have many, many uh, real use cases, real reference cases that we can talk about that shows that we can get into uh, those kind of numbers. And that's really what changes it from being a reactive uh, operations to something where your operations people are only dealing with the complicated stuff, the stuff that algorithms couldn't automatically handle. If we talk about the very last one, the AI-based auto event correlation, uh, then one of the things that we are really keen on is to deliver these kind of solutions as configuration-free. And what we mean by that is that we've seen a number of places where you say, well, you can buy a system that has a data lake and a very smart algorithmic system, but you need to train it. You need to, uh, to figure out what you do, need to do. You essentially need to employ a data scientist. And, and that's not a good thing, right? Because that's expensive and that implies that you don't get value out of the system immediately. So in our analytics module, in our um, off-switch solution, there is out of the box automatic lock and event analytics available. 
uh, it gives you smart ways of visualizing uh, correlations it's doing. It has this concept of a time machine where you can replay what is happening up to things happening. Because another thing we notice is that it's well and good if a machine learning algorithm says there's something strange going on here. We have an anomaly. It's out of the baseline. It's not normal. But then you need to investigate. But what is then really going on? Why is it not normal? And there, out of the box, we have uh, visualization solutions that allows you to actually then visualize what is going on and, and find that out. There is also very much a predictive analytics so that you can you can uh, understand the, the trend that is happening that, um, that normally this is the load of a given uh, service. Uh, we know that uh, Friday afternoon there is a spike in load. We know Monday morning there is a spike in load. And we can uh, then compare how these evolve over Fridays and Mondays over the months and thereby uh, uh, have a prediction about are we running into capacity problems in the future? When will that happen? That's another thing that is where machines are very good. Algorithms are very good because they can, they can look at these data sets constantly do the analysis. And most operators, they don't want to do that. Uh, but they want, to, they want to have the predictions getting into them. When you have done the, the previous one, you have all of these uh, uh, event reductions, uh, correlations, AI-based uh, correlation done, then we get to the concept of what are you going to do about it? And that's really, well, the output is critical, critical prioritized events. Now, can you then do automated corrections? Can you do automated workflows? Uh, can you deliver uh, audit trails of what you've been doing? Well, if you automate how you do the corrective action, then you can actually understand uh, over time what had been done so that you can analyze how can I optimize that later. So you can start applying algorithms on the right-hand side of this picture. And what we see is that you have these uh, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of raw events collected daily where you are, how big your organization is, doesn't really matter. It's about scaling, right? And get that down into few critical events that even those are then automatically managed. Our primary solution for that is uh, operations orchestration, which is essentially a, a robotic process automation tool uh, that allows you to have workflows for any given situations where it would do what the operator would otherwise do. Uh, there are two advantages to, uh, to operations orchestration that you don't get out of just writing some scripts that can reset a server or whatever. One is that it's running from a control central repository so that any run of it is um, locked. And therefore, you have an audit trail of everything that is actually happening. And you can use that to figure out, are you optimizing the way you're doing your things? It's also visual. So even though you can also uh, write code and, and have YAML representation of it, you can actually understand what is going on. But by opening the flows, and you can see uh, what will happen if I run a given flow, uh, you can potentially create a, a modification of it. But the other side that is of real value in operations orchestration is the tool we have evolved over many, many years. And we have a community around it. So there is more than 8,000 automated workflows out of the box with the tool. So the likelihood of there already being a solution for what you want to do or a solution that only needs minor modifications to work in your operating environment is very high. So it's not just a tool. It is a solution out of the box. It also interfaces to incident management system, can be used to incident management system, can be used to raise incidents, can go back to defect system. It can really robotic automate all the processes operators otherwise would do manually. And that is actually a pretty important aspect also of AI ops. The, the artificial intelligence is also about what do you do when you have a critical event. And there is an aspect of it's not only about doing something about it, but before you do that, you typically, an operator would do some investigation, right? would say, well, is it really true that this server is not responding, not working? Can I lock into it? Can I do this? Can I do that? Before you conclude that what to do. 
and you can also automate those operations. We have an example of that uh, with, a, with a large global oil and gas company, I can't mention the name of it, <clears throat> but they applied this solution. And, uh, and because we have audit trails of everything that goes on, they could actually very precisely go into the hour and, and figure out how much have they saved in operational manpower in running the solution, right? And they got to a point of automating over 95% of what they would otherwise do manually in operations. They saved $4 million in a single year, which is pretty cool. Um, of course, we are very happy because that can pay for the bill, uh, also for us, but for them, it was a huge win. And it's every year. And they can even continuously uh, work on improving on that. So that's, uh, that's impressive. And it's not something that really requires uh, rip and replace new kinds of solutions. It's just step by step to introduce these technologies that are part of our solution. That was step four. <clears throat> so what can you do in step five? Isn't this everything you want to do? Well, for many people, when they talk about a full stack AI ops, this is what they're talking about. That's, that's step four. If you get to this, you really, really have an advanced operations environment best in class. But there is one final step, and that is to be all inclusive. And you can actually, in some cases, do aspect of step five, even if you haven't done all of step three, four, and well, two, three, and four. Uh, so this is about really understanding the operations part in the bigger world of delivering digital, the digital transformation your organization is part of. <clears throat> the figure on the, on the right-hand side of, of this um, is somewhat complicated to look at. Um, and in this presentation, I won't be able to tell you all the details of what this is about. It is really about how would you fully run your organization uh, through plan, build, deliver, and run of digital services. And of course, if you're interested in AI ops, you are very likely sitting in that, uh, wouldn't call it the last box, but almost in the run part, in the right-hand side, called operations, right? This is where you're sitting. This is where you're, you're trying to improve. This is where all the issues that all the other guys are creating are ending up and you need to deal with them, right? And when you're doing the, the, uh, the AI ops, the full stack AI ops, you engage, you observe, you act, then really what you're starting to do is you are interacting with traditional IT service management, right? So you interact with the support side, you interact with the fulfillment side in changing stuff. You provision another server to scale out a solution, you, you reset servers, you, uh, you reconfigure stuff, right? So you are working that continuous operations. That is pretty well understood in the industry. Uh, that is what is also by some people just called clip closed loop incident process management. Uh, and, and you can do that and you can be better at it using what I described in step one to four. To four. Now, if you wanna move one step up in that, <clears throat> you need to have AI ops to meet DevOps, right? So what is DevOps? Um, Again, there's a lot being said about uh, DevOps. Um, one way of portraying DevOps is that, and, and that's kind of the original official definition is, you take the development team and you uh, combine it with the operations team. And then uh, those teams together would take responsibility of both developing and running all the new digital services, which is very nice in theory. In practice, if you do it, it's still nice, but in most organizations, DevOps is actually implemented by development taking over operations, right? The developers are also pushing into some cloud platform somewhere, and they, they, uh, they do that continuous deployment after they've done their continuous integration, and then they, they monitor uh, what is going on, and they immediately feed it back continuous feedback into their development life cycle. So if they made a, a mistake, they made a bug, uh, or, or the uh, product is not performing well, they, um, they fix it in the code and then they push another uh, solution out. 
what you need to do as an operations team to actually help that team and be integrated with that team so that uh, you can truly be the operations for development. So you could call it ops for dev or AI ops for dev so that you integrate your solutions with what is going on there. And the advantage is that you will have early warning of what is gonna happen. All the internals of how these applications are gonna be monitored uh, is something that developers know that you can actually push to the developers that this is what I would like you to prepare for, to configure, to develop in your product that makes it easier for me to actually monitor it and do corrective actions. Uh, all the uh, run books that you need in order to do something, can it please be part of the development cycle? That is very powerful and almost worth a complete presentation in and by itself how to do that. Uh, but you can ask questions and we can come back to you around that. So that's AI ops meets DevOps to really understand what is, what is happening. The other one is AI ops meets security or ops sec or sec ops. And that's the, uh, the concept of you need to make sure that your solutions are continuously in compliance with, with all the, uh, well, all the rules, all the governance that is being set by, by the organization and all the things that the security guys are, are doing. So, uh, and, and what you can use that for in traditional operations is among other things, the fact that saying, well, if something is not in compliance, then that's a higher risk then it's more important that you take care of issues that you, you see around it. There's something around, well, if the security operations are figuring out that there is a potential breach or whatever, then you can um, um, uh, use that in, in understanding, well, maybe these servers are overloaded or whatever, because there's something going on here. If there is a distributed denial uh, attack, then, then uh, you need to be informed about that, but also the other way, you might discover it and you can inform the uh, the security organizations around it. Uh, so the little green arrow here is actually not fully representing all the aspects that goes into having AI ops meet the security organization and the compliance organization and the governance organization. But it is an important aspect to, to drill into it. We have an integration between our um, data center automation suites that also have a lot of compliance solutions, for instance that allows us to have that, that continuous operations integration so that a compliance issue becomes an operational issue, becomes an incident if it's not solved. Uh, but before it becomes an incident, uh, continuous operation can potentially fix it, right? <clears throat> then there's an aspect of AI ops becomes self-serve. Uh, what does that mean? Well. The, uh, the first thing is that to understand that right now in the industry at large, there is a move towards the entire IT organization, the information technology organization that delivers digital to the businesses. They need to become self-serve. If somebody needs something, they should just be able to have the same easy experience as, as you go to a cloud provider to request it. But that would also be that part of saying, if you're a development organization, you want to request a platform or a set of servers uh, for running a new uh, application, then they should be able to also uh, consume operations services um, to make it possible to, um, to easily um, be part of operations to define uh, what operations you want to do. And that has the flip side that the operations team will actually fully understand what is consumed, by whom, uh, what is the priority of it, what are the service level agreements that are expected, uh, so that you have that as a feed into the AI ops of what is happening. Because what is gonna happen in the future, uh, it's already happening today, in many organizations is that it becomes much more dynamic what is running in, in operations. It changes every day, not every quarter. Uh, and therefore, it's very important that AI ops is linked to that side. Else, again, it just became chaos. The only way you can figure out what goes on is only by applying um, machine learning in data lakes. But wouldn't it be smart if you're actually informed when something happens so that you could uh, algorithmically take care of it instead of trying to figure it out in the needle in the haystack what happened? And the final one is that AI ops needs to meet the business. 
and I actually already talked about it in um, in step two, because by presenting these business value dashboards, you're actually doing a continuous insight, a systems of insight for the organization. You know what is actually running. You can sell that back into the portfolio team, the strategy team, the business owners that typically interact with IT over in the left-hand side on the plan side of stuff. It is also that place where services are initially being defined. This is where business come in and say, I, I need a new uh, marketing campaign, therefore I need a, a better uh, platform for my marketing information, and then you go out and develop it and put it into production. But the original requirements, the original importance, the original budget, the original owners, they defined over in the strategy side and the portfolio side. Wouldn't it be great if that information was made available to the operations team so that the algorithms you have there can take it into account. Is this a high priority service or a low priority service? Uh, is it running the uh, menu system in the cantina? And then it's okay if it's, if it's not working right now, right here, as opposed to if it's really the uh, order entry system for the, uh, for the primary business of the uh, corporation. So that is simple, right? It's just uh, uh, 10 value flows you need to integrate with. Uh, no, it's not simple, I know that. But want to portray the fact that creating a really first class, leading edge, all-inclusive AI solution implies that you need to understand a bigger picture of what it's part of. And again, I'll have a discussion with, with Sucru's partner um, uh, later in this presentation on, on how to do that. Now, um, you're going to ask yourself probably, okay, if I'm going to do this all-inclusive um, operations, um, can I really do that with, with operations bridge from MicroFocus? No, you cannot. Operations bridge uh, serves a very precise uh, area in this end-to-end -end architecture. It is the operations uh, center, right? You, uh, you would, uh, would complement it with uh, network operations management uh, potentially. Uh, if you if you have a lot of networking stuff you are you are managing that becomes one of the features into it. It can integrate with with our solutions around security, um, but it's an open composable architecture. So you don't need to use our products in the rest of it, but you can. Obviously, we um, we integrate with service management systems, and we have one ourselves, SMAX Service Management Automation Version X, which takes care of this. Uh, service catalog, uh, incident management, change management processes, et cetera, right? And we have a, a fully closed loop integration uh, with, with that system. But we also integrate with the competitors in the market if that's relevant. When it comes to actually helping the, the DevOps situation, we have a solution called hybrid cloud management that truly is hybrid that understands how you deploy stuff both in, in the um, in the public clouds, in the private clouds, on the traditional uh, side. <clears throat> and that is an important aspect of, of that uh, stack where service management is on top and then uh, cloud management is at the bottom. And that would typically uh, include that there is a, a number of embedded operations operation scripts that would allow you to provision the, the services, but also change the services. And that is the integration you would then have with the operations bridge in doing all of that change. So you get a little bit of hybrid cloud management in the operations orchestration uh, tool that is part of the operations bridge solution, but there's full integration with it if you also add in the hybrid cloud management. And then we have the modules I mentioned earlier around data center automation, which is around all the compliance, et cetera, and the details of standing up services in a data center. All of these parts are really tied together with a, a common CMS a data model, the UCMDB data model, which uh, can be driven left to right so that it's planned configurations, but it also have very strong discovery capabilities that allows you to really understand the topology. And as you recall, back from the start of the presentation, the, um, the concept of the uh, uh, topology-based correlation is pretty important. Now, 
if we move further to the left on this picture, you have the concept of actually managing the, uh, the development of solutions. So if you want that big clip that truly DevOps integrated, then you need to move into to that area. And, and we have a solution, application lifecycle management Octane, uh, LM Octane. Uh, again, we can work with other uh, solutions in this area, uh, but, uh, but our own is obviously integrated uh, there. And then there is a number of tests associated, and that's actually another interesting aspect of the AI ops is that, well, what is the status of the tests of the things you're putting in production, right? If you had that as input also, you would know whether it's a simple patch release or it's a complicated uh, new release that hasn't been security scanned, hasn't been run through Storm Runner for, for performance testing, which increases the likelihood of something going wrong. The risk associated is higher, which also implies that criticality very quickly uh, uh, migrate up. So you can get a lot of interesting information from these tools to help you in, in debugging what is going on in operations. And then finally, on the very left-hand side, we have project and portfolio management that integrates. So what I want to show in this slide is basically to say, okay, if you want to have the full all-inclusive operations, you need to understand that landscape. We can, do, we can cover all bases. We can help you in all aspects. If you are using some of our competitors in that area, that's perfectly okay. It's an open composable architecture. It's actually based on a standard that we are part of driving and a lot of our um, uh, competitors in the market are supporting the very same standard called IT for IT. Uh, and again, I could talk a couple of hours on, on what goes on with that standard. That's not the purpose of this presentation today. So that really concludes my presentation on what are we doing with uh, uh, and what is our vision and what do you need to do around AI ops. Um, I want to remind you that there is opportunities for you to, to ask questions uh, during this, or you can also do it to your reps or to email or, or whatever. Uh, we'd we'll be happy to answer a lot of these questions. As it's not a live event, we cannot in the same degree take questions uh, online as, as we go about, but please write them and we will. There are people, my colleagues, sitting ready and to answer these questions as well. So with that, I would like to invite in um, Ketil from Sucus Partner, that uh, is one of our um, great customers that are actually implementing a number of the things we just uh, uh, discussed here. So Ketil, are you online? I'm online. Excellent. And, uh, hopefully you can hear me and see me. We can, we, can, we can hear you, at least. I cannot see you because I'm presenting. Uh, yeah. can, can you talk a little bit about yourself? Uh, uh, who are you? Yeah, that I can. Uh, I'm a tech nerd. Uh, I'm uh, uh, educated as a tech IT technology engineer specializing in system development. And I've been working with uh, uh, IT from 1994, mainly with operation and uh, management after a short time where I've worked with actual development. Uh, then I started in Circus Partner in 2005 uh, after working as a CTO in one of the hospitals that is now our customers. And uh, well, at the present time, I'm uh, uh, responsible for one of our processes, the service configuration uh, process. And uh, at the, the same time, I'm uh, trying to combine the, my professional work with a selection of non-IT activities on a small farm southeast in Norway. So yeah, that's uh, that's me. Cool, excellent. I, I have a number of questions for you. for you. Before doing that, we should probably also introduce Sucus Partner, what it is. But again, before that, I want to say this is really an interesting uh, extra set of uh, interest. You have a, a bartender and brewer and farmer. Um, I, I can see how that that combines nicely. If what you're farming is the stuff you're brewing with. <coughs> But I'm pretty yeah. sure you can also apply a lot of technology to to that process. Oh yes, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. We, we we could probably talk hours about that as well. But, <laughs> okay. Uh, I, yeah. It's fine. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. It would be nice to see the audience to see whether they wanted us to dive uh, best the the rest of the time into to that topic. But yeah. we'll leave it for uh, for that. Uh, you can ask questions if you want to know what kind of a beer beer um, is, is brewing. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about uh, Sucus Partner, please? Uh, 
Yeah, uh, Circus Partner is uh, actually a, a company that was founded in 2004 to provide IT operations for a quarter of the hospitals in Norway by merging the IT departments from the old hospitals. And we have a vision of being a partner for developing healthcare. And we do that by supporting uh, patient care in a safe and efficient manner. Uh, what we do is uh, we uh, uh, provide uh, the basic IT platform for development, operation and support for the health trusts in Southeast Norway. And we actually are the largest provider of such services in the country. Our employees have a deep knowledge and experience from both uh, the health sector and the IT sector. Uh, some of our key uh, facts is that uh, for this year we have a turnover for of 4.5 uh, million a billion. Uh, we have uh, 1,550 employees uh, operating approximately 2,500 application services uh, provided uh, to the users with 60,000 workstation, 11,000 servers, and uh, yeah, the number of users we are supporting is approximately 78,000 healthcare workers. Uh, we do this 24 uh, hours a day, 365 days a uh, year, and with more than 260 technicians on standby at any given time. So it's oh. uh, yeah, it's quite a big company. Yeah, and I can, I can imagine 24 by 7 is, is, is pretty important if it's healthcare. You, oh, yeah. you don't say, no, sorry, you, you can't report your issues on Sunday. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Um, so that, that would also, I, I could imagine, really imply that, um, again, the two sides of, of an organization like yours is around developing new and advanced services, but then delivering the services is very much this 24 by 7, uh, high quality, well controlled things. So, so an AI ops solution must be a pretty important topic for for your organization. Is that correct? Oh, that is correct. Uh, and of course, we we haven't uh, uh, really can, uh, come that far in in actually uh, using AI, but we definitely see that uh, this is something that we uh, that we need. Uh, so. Um, uh, well, we we uh, we have done uh, quite a lot of uh, work uh, trying to get there. We know we are uh, we need to get there, uh, but uh, yeah, of course, uh, on our way to get there, we need to know both uh, our own and our customers' value streams well to know what we are actually uh, <laughs> what we are actually. Uh, uh, expected to deliver. So right. uh, what? Yeah. So, so so what we what we are now we have a good set of basic data uh, that we are in the process of connecting and uh, modeling according to uh, our service information model, and mm -hmm. uh, we are also doing quite a lot of uh, work in qualifying that uh, information with uh, with uh, the roles that are managing and uh, and operating uh, these services. So uh, we have a quite a good understanding of our, uh, of our customers' value streams. We have quite a good understanding of uh, our own uh, internal value streams. And we do have uh, a good foundation for service modeling and understanding how the different platform services support these value streams. So, okay. uh, yeah. So, so, we so, have... so, so on, on the other axis uh, of upwards towards this consolidated seems like something you've done, but are you automated in, in, in what you're doing? Is... Uh, we're not really, uh, not, not automated uh, that much. We do have, uh, we do have defined uh, work processes. We, uh, we do know, uh, <laughs> we do have defined, uh, uh, you know, the defined, uh, 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 our our value streams, how we uh, how we do things, uh, and we have also started kind of uh, testing some of uh, some of the AI abilities, but uh, it, it's it's manually uh, mm. work, but by defined um, defined workflows. Right. Yeah. So my my I, I can can cheat by saying I, I did a pre-interview with you uh, before this uh, presentation, obviously, and and maybe I didn't. Uh, Place in the the, the green uh, star on on the on the 
uh, bottom axis correctly, you're probably further ahead in in qualified data than than it indicates here. But 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 okay, so you're you're midway in the in the process, kind of. Yeah. I guess is is that a fair statement? Yeah. Yeah, I would say that's a fair statement. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's 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 something that uh, that we see a lot of our customers. They are. They are one third of the way, maybe 50% of the way. They they know that full stack AI ops is is a um, is a vision for many organizations, and and um, and there is quite a lot of lot of things to do uh, as as part of it. Uh, so in 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 terms of reaching that uh, promised land, if you will, what what is the main activity that you have been uh, uh, trying to concentrate on working on in in order to get there. What what's the what's the big thing that that you that you are right now tackling or or think you have have tackled? Yeah, uh, to to get there, it's kind of very important that we know why we do things. What value do we provide to our business partner? Uh, how uh, do our business partner? use uh, our services uh, who are the users at the at our uh, customers and how do we actually provide this value with the tools to make available for them so so yeah it's kind of this uh, holistic uh, view uh, in the whole uh, it operation how we support the actual value and uh, the actual value actually supported uh, both to our external customers and and how we support it inside CQ's partner Right. No, that that's um, <clears throat> that, that's good to hear, and and I'm I'm very interested in this particular one because I know that because we have worked uh, as partners on 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 developing this uh, information model, if you will, and mm -hmm. understand it. And and actually, a number of the things that we we figured out working with you has been migrated back into our uh, CMS CMDB product. Um, mm -hmm. So 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 I guess that what you see here on. On, on this slide you provided to me on on the left hand side is 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 a as a high level abstraction of of the information model you're trying to capture is that correct yeah that, that's correct it's uh, kind of the the easy view on the, on the information model <laughs> <laughs> so some people might not find this one easy even but but if if you if you explain it could you explain a little bit more you you have the four bullets here obviously but uh, yeah. but 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 give a give a quick uh, overview on 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 what is what is part of that and why is it important to have all of these uh, layers as such yeah uh, the, the main reason for actually dividing this into uh, into this label uh, the, these layers is uh, to be able to maintain uh, control and information uh, for uh, how uh, we provide services uh, both uh, both in in kind of the um, uh, the kind of the uh, focus on on uh, served cap capabilities for the business function uh, and the business processes, which is kind of the the first uh, the two top layers, which has the focus on capabilities and how we do this by uh, actually providing uh, uh, application services and technology. So so we have this customer service layer that uh, consists of uh, actually a, a group of capabilities that uh, is uh, grouped to to support uh, uh, business areas for for the the hospitals we provide services for and we also have kind of customer services or, or portfolios with capabilities that CQ's partner needs to be able to provide uh, the, the the tools for the for the hospital so uh, we both have the the business uh, areas used in the hospital and the business areas for for how we deliver the IT IT platform services. Uh, but inside these uh, kind of customer service uh, top level portfolios, we, uh, we have defined uh, business services that is focused on how we deliver value for, uh, for, uh, for the business uh, processes at the hospitals and, and internally. And then we have the application layer that, uh, uh, that is uh, a set of uh, of application services that uh, we use to uh, 
provide the users with the possibility to use the capabilities that uh, that's included in the business service. And of course, we also need to uh, to have quite uh, a good understanding of uh, how we actually make these application services available by using technology. So the bottom layer is kind of the technology services uh, for databases, network, uh, security, uh, yeah, and uh, and so on. Right. So, uh, yeah. No, I I I I think this is important uh, for for a lot of people to understand because if if you look at this and you divide it in in the middle, sort of mm -hmm. between the technology and the application layer, if if you just only work on discovery technologies, you might be able to touch the application layer, but only just touch it. But you, it's very, very difficult to uh, to discover what is going on higher up, and and so without that, I, I guess that's what your conclusion is. Without having that, then it's actually very difficult to do a a good uh, operations, uh, whether you call it AI or not, it doesn't really matter, because you need that information as well. Yeah, yeah, we we, we need to know what kind of value do we provide to uh, to our customers. And uh, yeah, and that, that's kind of what the top, uh, uh, the two, three top uh, layers here will will show us and, and give us the opportunity to uh, to include in our uh, our models. Yeah, I, I think there's another thing that the left hand side picture shows, uh, which is that it looks easy to begin with, right? It's it's just the uh, uh, the uh, the customer um, service couldn't change that. Uh, is mm -hmm. uh, is delivered by by uh, business uh, services, which is delivered by application services, which is running on top of technology services. That sounds easy, right? But if you look at a little bit, just even at this high level diagram, well, it's it's a business service is both decomposed into applications or construct of applications, but it's also using other application uh, mm -hmm. uh, services. And you have this on the on the right hand side. Uh, no left hand side the integration services as well yeah um i mean is it, is it fair to say that it took a long time to truly understand how those relationship works in your organization <laughs> oh yeah definitely uh, <laughs> as, as you say it's it's kind of easy in the first way when you see it yeah we we do provide some uh, tools for uh, for capabilities for the for the customers and uh, uh, you know uh, we do this uh, by grouping uh, functionality and capabilities with applications oh, easy but when you do uh, do uh, kind of the dive into the details, then it, it is very complicated because you have these relationships between applications. You have relationships, uh, including the integrations, as you say, and, and to, to be able to kind of decide what kind of detailed level do we need to, to actually have, have the correct the level of information and uh, uh, and, and information in in uh, in the UCMDB and uh, the service configuration uh, the configuration management systems and so on. Uh, that's kind of yeah. It, it's a long it's a long road and it's uh, uh, it's uh, kind of uh, difficult to get both the customers and our operational. Uh, uh, our employees working with operations to to understand this, right? So, so if 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 I if I put a, a few numbers on it, if if you take the very top level, the mm. the, the business and customer um, uh, services, how many of those do you have? You you yeah. might have mentioned it in the previous one. How, how big is that? Uh, for for the customer service, we have uh, twenty or twenty one portfolios uh, at the present time. Uh, which we have uh, have a role that is a portfolio manager, and uh, each of these uh, portfolios uh, are uh, implemented uh, slightly differently for each of the hospitals. So for each of these twenty customer services, we have one uh, customer service instance uh, for each of our uh, of our uh, hospitals which is, uh, I think we have uh, nine hospitals and some private customers as well. Uh, and uh, for the business services, uh, I don't have the actual number, but uh, on the logical level, I think we now have around uh, 100, 150 business services uh, defined 
which uh, then again is uh, implemented and uh, instantiated for each uh, customer. So uh, each business, logical business service is instantiated with, uh, with the production service, uh, test service, and a development service. And so on, when we get down to the application services, we have around, uh, I think, 1,700 uh, logical application services. And uh, we have modeled uh, approximately 2,500 instances when we are fully operational uh, when we have fully operationalized uh, this service information model in the cms i guess we will have about six seven thousand application service instances right. and uh, yeah so 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 so, uh, so that's actually pretty impressive numbers but but what you're saying is also that you you're in in the middle of the roadmap of implementing this and you you got uh, a couple of thousands of the application services but but you really need to triple that. Uh, how long time will that take you? Do, you? do you have an idea about how long time you, you think it'll take you to get yeah, there? We, yeah, as, as you say, we have uh, we have done this for uh, one third our, of our complete portfolio by now. And uh, I think by the first quarter of uh, next year, we will have kind of, uh, of finished the initial modeling and uh, we'll have uh, the complete the portfolio uh, for the top three layers. Wow. Uh, so but, and that, that's kind of kind of a big work to, to get there. Uh, and uh, then uh, we start the fun part by uh, actually doing all the technology services because uh, now we have relationships between application services and, and technology used. But when we actually are opera, opera, <laughs> opera, <clears throat> when we are operationing, <laughs> yeah. Operalizing, it's, it's different word, yeah. yeah. <laughs> go, go ahead. I'm Norwegian, it's <laughs> operalizing the, the technology services. I guess we'll be looking at tens of thousands of, of technology service instances. Yeah. And, and before we do that, we really need to have automation in place. Right. But, but, but that's, that's, a, that's a pretty important then segue to my next question here is to say, well, well in order to because you, you can't maintain all of this uh, manually only in operations all the time. So, so, so what is your view? And when I talked about the all inclusive uh, um, integration, what is your view on, on, on how to, to solve that to make it uh, more automatic as you move into the future? Mm. Yeah, uh, of course, b before we can start uh, automating things, we, uh, we really need to have full control of, uh, of how we deliver things and, and uh, actually having a complete CMDB containing all the, the information about uh, the technology we use. We do need to have control over the portfolios for each of these levels. Because we, we do need to know what the, what the hospitals are going to need uh, in the next uh, one to five years. We need to know what kind of technology CQS partner is going to use to, to actually uh, provide these services. So, so having, having, uh, uh, having control of, of what do we need, how do we uh, deliver it today, how do we plan to deliver it, that, that, that's kind of the first take. We need, we need to have a complete the CMS system and a completely uh, operational, uh, a completely uh, service uh, backbone with both, both uh, with, with both the portfolio objects and uh, and uh, how we need to deliver them and what we deliver. Right. Yeah. So, so I, I I show this this slide, which is back to this end-to-end -end, uh, architecture, and I I've overlaid what what actually in, in IC for IC standard is called is the service backbone. And that's the concept of saying what you have on the right hand side, which is desired an actual service or well, you end up in the actual service. That's what you store in the CMDB, right? Yep. And that's what should be instantiating the model you just showed. But you're saying the one the way you want to drive it is really to understand all the way from when you start portfolio planning two, three, five years out in the future, you already have an understanding of what service will be coming you're ready for them as they move from left to right. Uh, you, you, uh, you gave me a, a, a picture um, the, uh, the other day on, 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 on how you're doing that, uh, which is, is something around the, the life cycle of the services 
is not just the life cycle on, on the right hand side, but also the life cycle earlier in the planning cycles. Mm. Um, so, um, so could you talk a little bit about what, what, what is captured in, in each of these stages? Yeah. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, where we are now, we do have a kind of a good CMS containing the actual services and uh, containing the data that we use in the day-to-day -day, uh, operations. So, so uh, the the box on the right side there with actual services that it uh, is what uh, what is actually included in the CMS today uh, and the CMS containing of uh, MicroFocus Service Manager and uh, the UCMDB and uh, um, the uh, asset management uh, part. So, so, okay. so that is kind of what we what so, we have started with, yeah. Yeah. So, so that also implies that the, today you can already do the topology-based correlation and and mm -hmm. and 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 the and the basic uh, first set of correlations that I talked about earlier. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Excellent. And, uh, yeah, but but uh, to be able to kind of uh, support uh, the the needs that uh, are coming in the future and that we already know we we do need today, we need to have a focus on these boxes on the left side, which is actually something we have started to implement. Uh, implement support for now. Uh, this uh, service information model actually contains uh, all these uh, parts of the of the service backbone for all the levels in the uh, yeah you showed in the in the foil before. So we do have a kind of a, a service backbone matrix uh, contained in conceptual, logical service releases and actual services that are uh, uh, that are defined and uh, modeled in our uh, in our IP systems uh, today uh, but mainly in the in the service manager and what we are doing now is we are implementing uh, implementing portfolio support by uh, by uh, APM and uh, Octane and uh, and that part of the the portfolio to uh, to actually give our portfolio managers uh, the correct data on on these conceptual and logical and and release parts to uh, to able to uh, uh, to deliver new actual services in the end. Right. So 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 that's a little bit coming back to this picture that you say that in in order to to really be efficient at the operations bridge with the correlation, you really really need to get control on the your project and portfolio management and your application lifecycle management. Uh, because that's what really feeds the data so that you don't have to maintain the, I think you, you said that the business services and, and the uh, client services, they are, you have about 200 of those, and the life cycle of those are, uh, are, are controlled at the project portfolio management, and you have 6,000 applications, and, and the new ones are coming in there on, on, the, uh, on the bill side. So, so that's what you are, you're really moving hard to automate and integrate. Is, is that correctly understood? Yeah, I, uh, I think you got it there, yeah. Excellent. No, so, um, but, but that also then implies that if, if you look at the, the, uh, the five steps that I presented um, just before, you are, uh, you're, you're kind of all over the map, right? In the sense <laughs> yeah. that you're you're doing part of the step five um, mm -hmm. because it's hard, and but you say you you need to do it. You know you need to do it, and 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 so you're doing that one. But you're also doing part of of step one, two, to four, uh, sort of in parallel. Is is that a fair statement? Yeah, I would say that is uh, that is a fair statement. Uh... And, and and I think there is a good learning uh, from that, and and that's coming back a little bit to the maturity curve aspect of it. Is that saying well, the uh, getting the all inclusive is the is the final step, but but that final step is a very very deep step. So it's good to start planning from that uh, early on in the process. Uh, I think you got that right. So that's uh, that's that's pretty cool. I'm, I'm encouraged by by seeing that. Um, so, so, but but there is another aspect um, of of the of the management here, uh, and and that goes a little bit back to uh, to this aspect of um, of uh, maximizing the, the the process and remediation automation. So, are you also working on on those aspects? Where 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 do you stand with respect to that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> 
We, we are actually the, the, the event part is, uh, is uh, one of the places we have started to look at. Uh, at AI Ops, we have uh, implemented, uh, or we have started to implement uh, the, uh, the uh, Ops Bridge, uh, and we are using uh, OO to uh, to actually uh, start uh, uh, yeah start handling the the events. So so that is one of the areas we have started to look at it. Uh, mostly it's uh, kind of getting control over the workflows and uh, and the manual uh, processes. But uh, it it really looks promising what we have seen so far in that part. Okay. Yeah, I, I hope you would be successful with it, obviously, uh, for, because it's our product. One of the yeah. things we are, we are trying to make sure is that, that it's, a lot of the things are automated, so that when you implement it, uh, a lot of these rules are just available out of the box. So, so I, I certainly hope you will be successful with that. Um, if, you should, if you should think about uh, all of the things you're doing here around the, the comprehensive operations uh, that, that you're doing, um, I'm deliberately not saying AI, um, what do you believe is the biggest obstacles uh, that you have? Oh, we do have some. Uh, I think one of the, one of the more biggest obstacles is is actually trying to or, or making uh, the whole organization seeing the big picture. Uh, uh, you know, I, as a circus partner, as a kind of a lot of the, the companies that we can compare ourselves with are kind of uh, working in silos, both operation-wise and, and process-wise. And we also do have a great pressure on the day-to-day -day operations. So uh, prioritizing the time needed for the cultural and organizational and process-wide uh, pro process changes is, is difficult. Mm -hmm. But uh, by using these uh, service information uh, model, uh, by um, uh, training the different uh, management uh, roles, the portfolio manager, the, uh, the actual uh, roles that is uh, responsible for the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, operations, uh, and, and getting them to understand where, uh, what kind of, or, or where is our place in the service information model? What kind of value do we provide to what kind of users and, and which uses with what? I think, I think that, uh, uh, yeah, that is uh, kind of, yeah, both what, uh, what we struggle with and, uh, and how we are, have started uh, trying to solve it. Yeah, no, it's it's a classical uh, triangle, I guess, where you say there's a solution as people, process, and technology involved, and and I'm I'm happy that you choose the operations bridge technology at the center of of how you solve it. But but your real challenge now is the uh, it's probably the people aspect. Uh, yeah. Some degree maybe the process, but maybe more the people aspect to really get people to understand uh, what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. Okay, I, I know that uh, with the with the work we've been doing with you, that we have used the IT for IT framework quite a lot to get people to understand the bigger picture. So, would you believe that that is really helping you? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, we have seen now uh, during the the process of uh, actually opera, uh, actually uh, starting to use the the ALM. Uh, we, we uh, when, when we implement this uh, service information model in the in the APM and uh, uh, start working with the portfolio managers, we uh, we see that uh, both the tools and uh, the model itself really helps uh, uh, getting them to understand what they have responsibility for and how they can be able to manage it and, and how they are actually working together with, uh, uh, with the roles that are responsible for, uh, for the operation part. Right, right. Okay. No, that, that, uh, that, that, that's good. That confirms my suspicion here. Mm. Uh, so so that, that's fine. Um, and maybe also a shout out to people listening to this is that in your organization, this getting that fundamental understanding how it all ties together is, is very, very important. We see in the organizations we work with where they are willing to invest in getting that understanding, they typically are much more successful in then implementing real value. Mm -hmm. uh, so so what, is, what is your next uh, primary step uh, you want to, to do? I, I know that you want to populate the entire model <laughs> and, and, and that's, 
uh, that you know, by itself a big thing, but what else? Yeah, uh, you know, as you say, uh, we need to continue uh, continue uh, populating the model and remodeling uh, our uh, services that we uh, we deliver to uh, today. So, uh, and that that will be the the main focus for the first quarter. But while we do this, it's uh, also important that we continue to investigate and implement the uh, process fixes workflows so the, uh, that we can actually start using the possibilities we already have in the, the IT uh, systems portfolio. Uh, uh, for instance, the, the ops bridge uh, functionality. Uh, right. And yeah, and we, we, we also use kind of AI in, uh, in other areas. So we know that it's, uh, it's, it's something that provides a great value. Uh, for example, in our HR services, we have already implemented uh, robots for handling salary payments and travel expenses, and, and see that uh, this uh, using AI using robots is uh, is very uh, is very useful and, and helpful. Right. No, and and uh, oops, I got to the the wrong slide here. Um, this is the one I wanted to show. That that goes back to saying, well, in, in our solution service management automation, um, we do have a lot of AI algorithms in that. Mm -hmm. and, and and that's where, for instance, support comes in. And you can say all the knowledge briefs and understanding of, of known problems or, or identifying new problems in the sea of all the incidents, that's also an important aspect mm -hmm. of AI ops and, and something that we didn't really come into in details in this presentation, but it actually can, can help a lot in, in that aspect. And that's closer to what you described in your HR system, that you have self-help available, so to speak, uh, using using AI. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. That's a, that's another good point where you can, you can get uh, value um, quickly out of the tools without having a complete change in in uh, in training of people, etc. So so quick quick value. Yeah. Good point. The uh, the the other thing that I I would encourage you uh, to think about uh, maybe in 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 this would be on the uh, on on the side of uh, of what I call step two because you are now starting to get to the point where you actually have an awful lot of, of really good connected information in your database. So uh, so thinking about the the right hand side of this picture to create more dashboards for your for your um, consumers and, and your business people in, in your organization. Mm -hmm. I think that could be a quick win for, for you. Uh, I think I encourage everyone that implement these solutions to think about uh, there's something that potentially comes before uh, all the algorithms and, and the automations. And, 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 and uh, once you have the information, you can do these kind of things. Yeah. OK. so. Uh, that, that pretty much concludes my, my quick question to, uh, to what you're doing. It's, it's very exciting what the, the path you're on in, in Circus Partner, and I really, really like the way you are, you're concentrating on really understanding the connectivity of everything that goes on. Uh, I, I think that will create an, an awful lot of, of, uh, of value to you. Any other comments you want to give uh, here at, at the end? Uh, no, it, it's kind of the, the focus on the uh, on the information because I, as a, as a service configuration manager, my uh, big focus is getting the uh, the data correct at the bottom to to make the other processes available to use the correct information to make the operational and the uh, and the managing roles uh, to, to make them available to deliver the value they are supposed, supposed to deliver so by uh, creating a correct uh, uh, correct uh, information in the bottom uh, through uh, configuration management uh, management system that uses this service model. It, it's kind of my contribution as a service configuration manager to 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 make the other processes and uh, uh, and uh, roles uh, able to do the, to do their their job. Cool. Okay. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ketil, for, for spending time with us here today in, in, uh, in explaining what goes on in, in Sucus Partner. Much appreciated. It's always good to hear uh, the real fights going on in, 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 in the real world in, instead of the theoretical of what you should be doing. So thank you a lot. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and so uh, just in, in summary of this, uh, sorry, I had a bit of echo here. Um, 
really AI ops is much more than applying machine learning to operations, uh, right? Um, it's not just some smart algorithms, there's much more to it. The other key takeaway I want to leave you with is there is no silver bullet. Um, uh, there is no simple algorithm that will solve all your problem. And the world as it is, is hybrid and complex. I talked a little bit about the embedded AI that goes into uh, some of the SaaS services or some of the new platforms, et cetera. And, and yes, that's great that we have this AI because then it, uh, without it, it would be even more complicated, but it's also at the same time make things more complex to understand. And if you don't understand, it's very difficult to automate and optimize. And so what AIOps is really about is to balance between the humans and the automation. Be ruthless about how much you automate, but you can only do that if you have good information foundation, right? And then humans can step in where the automation cannot take over. And to paraphrase what, what Katie was explaining here is that thinking a bit more holistically about end-to-end -end what is going on helps a lot because that really rallies everything everybody around the same common goal. That is actually an example of this, that operations become part of the innovation cycle. Um, and then of course, I also want to leave you with this, that, that well, in MicroFocus, we got you covered. We understand how it works end to end. We have the solutions that, that, can, uh, that can support you. So with that, I'll say thank you for, for listening into AI ops in a cloudy world. And back to you, Remco. Thank you, Lars. Thank you. A lot of information. Um, thank you, Kitel. Uh, uh, great information. What I found most stunning and, and interesting is that uh, especially Sikahoo's partner has such a good vision of where they are today and especially where they want to go. And uh, so the maturity level, uh, but also, yeah, that's uh, impressive, impressive, impressive presentation. Thank you very much. And we will continue with the other presentation. Thanks, Lars, and see you again uh, live, hopefully, soon enough. <laughs> hopefully. Thank okay. you. Bye. Bye-bye.